Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, New Horizons in Glaucoma Treatment with Dr. Jeffrey Liebman. My name is Elena Sturman. I am the president and CEO of the Glaucoma Foundation. The Glaucoma Foundation is dedicated to improving the lives of people with glaucoma through education and outreach, and the encouragement and support of innovative research into the prevention and reversal of blindness from glaucoma. This year, we awarded funding, including three name grants, to researchers working on various therapeutic targets and delivery mechanisms, neuron protection, retinal and ganglion cells regeneration, and exfoliation glaucoma. In October, we welcomed researchers from around the world to Foundation's 27th Annual Optic Nerve Rescue and Restoration Think Tank to delve into new avenues for research. This meeting fosters creative thought and collaboration among the world's leading glaucoma experts, neuroscientists, geneticists, biologists, immunologists, and other specialists to provide a unique opportunity for scientists to apply the research and progress of other diseases and systems to the challenges of glaucoma. However, everything we do is ultimately for the benefit of patients and their families. We hope to continue to be a trusted source of information about glaucoma and what it is to live with this disease. Today's webinar is sponsored by Santa and Pharmaceuticals. We are so grateful for their support and their incredible partnerships. Today, we are excited to tell you about recent advancements in treatment of glaucoma. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and you can send us questions at any time using the chat button on your screen. We have a very large audience today and have received a lot of questions already. So I apologize in advance if we won't get to everybody. We will try to do our best. And now it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Liebman. Dr. Liebman is a Shirley and Bernard Brown professor and vice chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Columbia University Medical Center, where he also serves as director of the Glaucoma Service. He's a fellow of American Academy of Ophthalmology, Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, and American College of Surgeons. He currently serves as president of the World Glaucoma Association. Dr. Liebman is a co-founder of the New York Glaucoma Research Institute and the American Glaucoma Society Foundation. Dr. Liebman has lectured widely in the United States and abroad on glaucoma diagnosis and management. His current main areas of research interest include the causes of glaucoma, glaucoma progression, glaucoma surgery, ocular imaging, and neuroprotection. Dr. Liebman is a member of the executive board of the Glaucoma Foundation, as well as the member of Scientific Advisory Board. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Liebman. Jeff, take it away. Uh, thank you, Elena, for that nice introduction and for introducing uh, the Glaucoma Foundation. Um, I've been, been my privilege to be a member of the board of directors of the Glaucoma Foundation for maybe 20 years, and I've watched it grow into the organization it is now under Elena's leadership. Today, I've been asked to speak about new horizons in glaucoma care. Um, and when I think about this topic, I always come back to the patient. Um, we call it the N of one, a single patient who's sitting before the doctor, um, and what glaucoma means for that patient. This is a uh, illustration given to me in a patient, from a patient at the time of her visit in 2003. And uh, she was artistically inclined and she drew out her blind spots um, over the Sports Authority logo in each eye. And uh, she described them as black lines that do not move and large floating objects and areas that were blurred. And it made me think about the, the need that we have to really address our individual patient needs and, and meet their expectations to try both stabilize their disease and allow them to have you know, productive lives with a high quality of, uh, of vision. And this has stuck with me throughout my entire career. We've learned a lot about glaucoma and what patients, um, how patients experience glaucoma. This is recent 
research from our institution that demonstrates that people with glaucoma even have trouble recognizing faces to some degree. Um, and that this decrease in contrast that are experienced by our patients um, really impacts their daily, daily lives in, in many ways. The other issue that confronts us as doctors, of course, and many of you are familiar with this, is that our populations are aging. And this is a sample of the US population in 1990, but by the year 2050, will be very different. There'll be many more people over the age, six, over the age of 65 and of course, glaucoma primarily affects people in this age range. Um, so the burden of the disease across the population is becoming greater for the healthcare system. Um, and also uh, the exposure of the disease is longer. So if someone develops glaucoma when they're 65 and the life expectancy is to 95, they'll have glaucoma for 30 years. That's, that's, a, that's a huge change in the disease management issues that we face. So all of these are challenging are challenges for our patients. And um, I, I think that it drives this unmet need of our patient, our patient, of our patients drives innovation in glaucoma treatment. And our goal as physicians and as researchers is to preserve vision and quality of life for all these individuals. Fortunately, we live in a world of rapidly changing paradigms and advancing science. Um, new discoveries in, 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 in biotech and biological science occur every day. Our technologies are rapidly improving. I'm sure many of you as glaucoma patients experience these technologies um, at the time of your visits, optical coherence tomography and visual field testing and all sorts of other types of diagnostic modalities. Um, precision medicine, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, um, uses genetics to transform the screening diagnosis and treatment of disease. I'm gonna spend most of the time today on translational science and how these scientific discoveries get translated into practical treatments for all of our patients. There are of course novel inter in interventions. We'll talk about surgical, um, devices, for example. Telemedicine has come to the fore in the age of COVID, of course. Um, many of us have experienced that ourselves. We have artificial intelligence coming down the road in, in glaucoma management, which will allow us to detect disease earlier um, and uh, help determine which patients might be progressing at a faster rate. And of course, we get back to the individualized patient, that N of one that allows us to uh, to, to treat people better. On the right-hand side of this screen, lower right, you'll see a formative eye cup. This is actually a, uh, being grown in a, in a dish um, where uh, an, a, a small, uh, essentially eye, is being grown from, cell, from individual cells. So these would eventually would be replacement cells that can be inserted um, into the human eye to replace cells that have been lost. The whole wor world is looking at science and technology to lead the way. Um, as you all know, um, the, the, the advent of the COVID vaccine within a year um, was really a scientific and medical uh, breakthrough. And you know, when the Economist magazine um, and biz the business world focuses on science as the future driver uh, of, uh, of essentially economic development, we know that science and all these, the ideas that have been percolating around to, to preserve vision um, will be funded and come to the fore. So as I mentioned, these new horizons in care are, are being driven by translational science. We have, we have new treatment paradigms um, in daily practice. We, have, we use fewer eye drops and fewer bottles than we did before. I think many of our patients are grateful for that. And I'm certainly happy as a treating physician not to tell them to take 10 drops a day. Sustained delivery systems, which may eventually make eye drops obsolete, are um, one has already been approved and more are on the way. We have less invasive and safer surgical techniques, uh, neuroprotection to enhance the survival of nerve cells that might be dying in glaucoma or for other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease are being tested. And again, precision medicine, precision ophthalmology and applied genetics, which I'll speak about. 
So medicines and lasers, what's new? You know, I, I wanted to point out a couple of things to you uh, this afternoon. Um, there was a study done um, from the United Kingdom that was published in 2019. It's actually a study that was um, replicated a study that we did here in the US in the, around 1990 um, called uh, looking at selective laser trabeculoplasty, which is a common laser procedure. It was called the light trial. And after 36 months, three quarters of the patients did not require any drops to remain at their target pressures. And they had a 97% chance that the laser was more effective than their eye drops. And although this trial was consistent with what doctors um, knew perhaps previously, it is driving a change in our care so that instead of just offering every patient eye drops as their first treatment, many physicians now will offer laser trabeculoplasty first and give this as an alternate method of treating the disease even very early rather than going through the traditional pathway, which would be the patient tries three or four eye drops, then does laser and then does surgery. So it's a general trend to move towards um, fewer eye drops, um, safer surgery, in this case, laser surgery, much earlier in the course of the disease, course of the disease for, the, for the majority of our patients. And of course, there are patients across the entire spectrum of glaucoma disease, from very mild or early disease to very advanced disease. And it's important that each patient um, discuss the status of their disease with their physician to determine which course of treatment is best. So let's assume that for a moment that we could do eye drops or laser surgery. Um, and we can, we should also discuss what's, cha what's changed with, with respect to medical therapy options. So of course, we all, all glaucoma patients at one time or another use eye drops. But the tendency now is to use drops that are only once per day. So in the old days, 15, 20 years ago, patients were taking some medications two, three, four times a day. And there are still patients who have to do that, of course. But our goal is to try to minimize the drop burden, make it easier for patients to take their eye drops. So as of now, there are three medications which can be given once a day. Um, so in theory, if we wanted to give a patient three different medications, we'd only have to use either three bottles or in, some, or in some cases we can get away with two bottles. So some of the medicines have, some of the bottles have two, more than one medication in it. So in this circumstance, a patient can take one drop in the morning, one drop in the evening, and be on a total of three medicines that are extremely effective without having to take drops throughout the day. That is a huge advance that's occurred um, primarily uh, over the last 10 years, let's say. Um, now many patients have trouble with eye drops. And if you look, saw the New York Times Magazine case, that was a glaucoma patient who had trouble taking her eye drops um, because she had difficulty with the preservatives in the medications. We now have three different types of medicines that have no preservatives. And this increases the tolerability of the medications. Um, for us. Um, as I mentioned, um, there are combination products. Um, there are now four of them available with two drugs in the bottles. Um, and that makes things much easier for, for all, of our, all of our patients. So trying to minimize the drops is critical. The last item on this list is something called sustained delivery. And uh, there was a um, medication approved um, that, that is available now, um, that has been studied uh, extensively in the United States, in Europe and abroad, um, where the medication is delivered through a small implant. This is an implant that's called Darista. Um, it is, this is after placement into the eye, a little tiny injector. The medication is in the eye. It settles down inside the eye. It's uh, releases by metaprost, which is the same as Lumigan, um, very slowly over four to six months. So the patient does not have to take any eye drops. 
this is really a, a astounding piece of technology. It took many years to develop. There are certainly difficulties associated with it. The FDA has approved it only for a single application. So if the patient uses it and receives it once, we're really not allowed to redose that. But as more information is, is gathered, we hope that devices like this can be used periodically so that people don't have to take eye drops. It's particularly useful for people who can't, whose eye be, eyes become too red or become irritated from the medications. So sustained delivery is a, a few, a, an important future option. And there are a lot of ways that these can be delivered. Sometimes we can make the medication can be put into punctal plugs to block the tear duct. We can give them by injection, either into the eye, to the back of the eye. Um, and all of these are being explored. You know, we also will have other types of devices that are wearables, just like my iWatch can tell me my heart rate and my uh, heart rhythm. Um, devices that are placed in the eye to measure the pressure are also be, will, be, will also become available so that the doctor can remotely monitor the pressure while the patient is at home and the patient doesn't have to use any specific devices at home. These are all breakthroughs that are underdeveloped. So what about surgery? And surgery is very complicated now. And I show this to you um, because in the old, you know, prior to uh, the development of minimally invasive glaucoma surgery techniques, there were really only two surgeries. There was trabeculectomy and tube implantation. But this is a chart of all of the different pathways we now have available to us as surgeons when it comes to managing uh, patients. And th this is a huge amount of, of inspiring research um, to look at less invasive um, surgeries that, that use new pathways to allow the pressure to be lower. Um, there's constant innovation in this surgical space. Um, some of these devices are used and concert at the same time as cataract surgery. Um, remember there are about 4 million cataract surgeries done every year in the United States and roughly 10% of that population has glaucoma or glaucoma risk that might benefit from one of these procedures. As these um, less invasive procedures are perfected, they'll be used for more patients with established glaucoma. And I mentioned also the sustained delivery. Imagine the challenge that we as surgeons and teachers have when we have to instruct residents or trainees in all of these different procedures. No one can become the master of all of them. It's very challenging for us. And we're, we're learning how, how to transmit that information. But as I mentioned earlier, this is just a, a graph demonstrating the increasing uptake of surgical procedures in the field. This is per year. So 5% of all glaucoma patients will receive some type of procedure in 2022. So um, that's, a, that's a fascinating change over time. This illustrates that, that trend. I'm gonna show you two devices that are, that are in, this, uh, this, in this arena. They're both very miniature devices. You can see the red arrow, the size of the Zen gel stent um, sitting on this dime. Um, it can be inserted either through the eye or um, uh, uh, via the surface of the eye. And it allows fluid to drain from inside the eye to outside the eye and lower the pressure. And here you can see how small it is sitting underneath the tissues of the eye, um, draining fluid out of the eye. The type of innovation that um, we all hope make, will make surgery much, much easier for us. Um, there is uh, another type of device um, under development available um, in Europe um, and recently studied in the United States called Preserflow, um, which allows a essentially a trabeculectomy type of, of operation to be performed very quickly and more easily than trabeculectomy. Um, this is of intense interest to surgeons who want to minimize side effects while getting the beneficial effect of the more invasive glaucoma surgeries and how this pans out over time um, will, will, deter, will be determined through other research projects um, that are ongoing and will be done. But this is, again, you know, tremendous amount of innovative work 
um, that uh, that is that is being made available to patients. The vast majority of all these procedures, though, are still laser procedures, and that's an office-based procedure that's that's extraordinarily common, and uh, will continue to be very common and continue to be used very very often. Um, so, um, what about the future? What does the future hold for us in terms of glaucoma patients? And one of the things that the Glaucoma Foundation has been very involved in over the years um, and uh, actually pushed the field along um, in its early days is the field of neuroprotection. You know, neuroprotection refers to um, the ability to protect nerve cells um, without lowering the pressure in your eye. So if we could strengthen the nerve cells from dying, that would be like the holy grail of glaucoma therapy. So 20 years from now, for sure, or maybe 10 years, or perhaps sooner, um, people will be treated with pressure reduction, but they'll also be treated with devices and medications that, uh, that can protect nerve cells. Um, this is an ingenious device that was originally developed for retinal, for retinal disease. Um, and is being now used in glaucoma. And we, we were fortunate to participate in a, in a phase two trial of it. Um, and inside this little rod on shaped structure on, this, on, the, on the top are tiny cells. Um, those cells uh, have been genetically modified. They're actually cells that come from the retina, they're called retinal pigment epithelial cells. And they've been programmed to produce proteins. And they live in this little tiny rod, like a little cage. And this cage gets placed into the eye. And inside the eye, the cells live there. Your body gives them glucose and nutrients and oxygen. And they pump out these proteins. These proteins are designed to protect nerve cells. So this little cage sits in the eye. The proteins are pumped out. The nerve cells receive a signal. It's really essentially a signal that says, live, be strong, um, don't die. And uh, it encourages them to, to, to remain healthy. And, and this is the future of this type of implant and these types of proteins are really the future of neuroscience. Um, as many as you know, glaucoma is a neurodegenerative disease. Nerve cells are degenerating and not in a similar way to other neurodegenerative diseases that we get as we get older, whether they be, it be Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or other neurologic conditions, these are all diseases of nerve cells as we age and you know, is a, an important frontier. And as we all get older, um, we all wanna live uh, you know, productive lives till, uh, till, the, till you know, 90 or 100 and maintaining our, our central nervous system and brain function is what it's all about. And this is how glaucoma will benefit in the future because of the huge amounts of research uh, funding that is directed towards those other central nervous system conditions that deal with nerve degeneration. Um, we use that information, we use those technologies um, to develop uh, products uh, for the eye. Here's where that little device sits inside the eye. Um, and it can sit there forever, placed once. Um, and we have uh, now 20 patients who have received uh, this technology. Well, what about vitamins? You know, for my whole entire career, um, we've been looking at uh, vitamins and alternate medicines uh, for the treatment of glaucoma. Um, and uh, this includes uh, vitamins across the entire spectrum, uh, you know, B vitamins, vitamin C, and so on, antioxidants. This is work that was done by uh, Dr. Simon, Dr. Simon John's laboratory, who was at the Jackson Laboratories in Maine at, at that time, is now with us at, at Columbia University. He did this original work looking at vitamin B3, very specific form of vitamin B3 called nicotinamide, that regulates um, energy production or helps assist energy production in cells, um, both in the little dish and also in animals. So he's an expert 
in mouse glaucoma. You know, the joke in the laboratory is that there'll be no more blind mice, but um, the nicotinamide um, helps the mitochondria. The mitochondria, you have to remember back to your high school biology, is the little portion of the cell that makes energy. And this vitamin, vitamin B3, serves as a, um, as a material from which the mitochondria make energy for the nerve cells. This is not a far-fetched type of concept. Of course, many of you may also have macular degeneration. And uh, in a very large study called the ARIDS study, the age-related eye disease study, it was demonstrated that vitamins um, therapy, antioxidants primarily, can benefit uh, patients um, who have macular degeneration. The first, one of the first uses of vitamins in the body was demonstrated to, to be effective. Um, we took this idea of using vitamin B3, um, nicotinamide, and uh, performed a study um, looking at nicotinamide and pyruvate, another, another type of vitamin, um, in patients with glaucoma. And this is actually going to be published shortly um, in uh, the, the, one of our journals, um, demonstrating that patients who received this combination actually had a slight improvement in their function in a very, over a very short period of time. Now, our study is not designed to try to, with the eventual goal of improving function, but it proves that the nicotinamide actually has some effect. It can get to the back of the eye. And um, our next phase of the project is to expand it um, to a larger group of people. Um, it's gonna be a year to a year and a half in duration. Uh, we're planning actually a multi-center project um, in, in three sites. And there are other locations now around the world in Australia, in the UK, where they're also picking up on this type of research result to do larger and longer trials to demonstrate how we can use this pathway to help um, stabilize the disease process. So the last topic I want to talk about a little bit is, is precision medicine. And, um, and how that relates to ophthalmology and glaucoma and genetics. So what, what is precision medicine? Um, precision medicine you know, applies science to care. This is a nationwide and really now worldwide effort to use the power of genetics um, to help us diagnose the disease and to develop new treatments and care for patients. And the, the applied part of applied genetics means that each person, you know, each patient, you know, is guided through a process that the individual patient can understand what the genetic testing might mean for them, what the, the results might mean for their families, which is you know, important to all of us as we think about, you know, subsequent generations. So in, in precision ophthalmology, of course, we want to provide each patient with a genetic diagnosis of his or her ophthalmic you know, condition. And you know, when you think about you know, genetics, all of us know our family histories. We're fortunate to you know, uh, know what our parents or our aunts and uncles diseases they have. We know that those are the things that we're susceptible to. And the genetic, the, the, the precision part of, of applied genetics, just uses the science that we have to really pinpoint um, those diseases with, with great accuracy. You know, in our institution, for example, in, in the two years since we started a precision ophthalmology program, we've had 1,300 patients who requested appointments, hundreds have gone through the process. And actually, I'll tell you about a couple of patients who actually got treated with gene therapy. Um, they're not glaucoma patients yet, but it proves the point that all of this is coming down the road. And the eye is particularly um, amenable to, to apply genetics. It's a localized organ. You can deliver the gene and the gene vector right to the eye. It's not as if you have to give an injection to the bloodstream in order to do that. But here's an example of a patient uh, that, that I saw actually, who um, is circled here in, in, in red. Um, and uh, the, the patient 
um, had a long family history of glaucoma. And we were able to isolate the gene for this family and tell them what caused the glaucoma in their family. But what does that mean? Um, so what that means for, for the patient is that um, they can have an earlier diagnosis of people in the family. So let's say if someone has two children, there's a 50% chance of getting the disease. They can test their, they can test their children, see if they're carrying the gene. If they're not carrying the gene, then they can be followed periodically like a regular person who's not at risk. But if they do carry the gene, that child needs to be followed more carefully for the development of, of, of the disease. For this particular gene defect, a gene called myosillin, um, patients need earlier, more aggressive treatment than most of them need surgery. So we would know that for this particular individual, surgery is the best option. Um, now this is a single defective protein that's, that's abnormal. And it could be amenable to gene therapy, essentially just deleting the gene. You know, we wonder, well, how is that even possible? You know, but we're all familiar now with the mRNA vaccine that delivers genetic material, you know, via vaccine, uh, the genetic material of the COVID virus so your body can develop antibodies to it. We can use a virus commonly used to deliver new genetic material um, to cells. We've all, many of you are probably familiar with the CRISPR revolution. And um, there's a, the, there are a tremendous uh, lot of literature about that. There's even a book by Walter Isaacson about, about the gene revolution. It's called Code Breakers, and it's a good one to read if you want to um, become knowledgeable about this particular field. So has this been applied and is it used now in, in, in human disease? And that's a question we get asked all the time. This is the first um, gene treatment um, that was developed for a disease that blinds children. Um, it's a defect uh, in, a, in, a, in a gene that causes a disease called Labor's congenital amaurosis. And this gene therapy is injected into the eye of children or young adults who are affected, gives them the corrects the gene defect that they have and restores vision to these individuals who would otherwise be continually losing their vision. So it's a, really a huge breakthrough in gene therapy. The treatment's very expensive. It started out as $800,000 for the treatment, the single treatment for one person. But when one thinks about that cost over a lifetime of preventing blindness, I mean, you can make a good argument that that cost it was small cost, small price for us to pay. But as these things become more, you know, more widely used, like everything else, the price will come down and it'll be available, I think, for most people who have this kind of condition. And there are certainly genetic conditions, single gene therapy conditions in glaucoma that run strongly in families that we're going to be able to correct. And those studies are underway in animals now. There's a lot of clinical trial activity in this regard. And, and I just use our institution as an example. We have 15 trials enrolling patients in gene-based therapies and interventions. So, you know, we have a, most of academic departments in the country have biobanks that are collecting specimens and doing this kind of work. You know, it is the treatment of the future and it's all gonna become, av become available. It's, when I began, you know, I was in medical school, this was, you know, in the lab, it was science fiction and I'm very happy to see it uh, come to fruition. There's lots of good reading material about the applied genetics. Um, ask your physicians about um, information that they might have, and you can certainly get that from the Glaucoma Foundation as well. Uh, so 10 years from now, precision glaucoma is gonna be a reality. And um, you get a blood test, we'll find out your risk profile, we'll understand who's going to progress at a more rapid rate, the gene, makeup of the individual will help determine the specific planning and treatment that individual will have. Um, this is going to lead to more advances in saving neurons, the nerve cells, protect them and eventually regenerate them. You know, I, I spoke to a patient today actually about um, rehabilitation 
and he had some interesting ideas about that as a patient. And we get a lot of uh, good ideas from the patients who we work with uh, who are suffering from the condition. You know, the Glaucoma Foundation, I did want to say a few words about the foundation because, you know, as I said, I've been very happy to be part of it because the Glaucoma Foundation over 30 years has awarded millions of dollars worth of grants, small grants that the government would not fund to in allow innovation um, in the field. And um, these projects have been translated into larger, much larger products, projects sponsored by the National Institute of Health um, or by pharmaceutical companies. Um, the Glaucoma Foundation is, has focused on fields of neuroprotection, genetics, exfoliation syndrome, um, and now is looking at uh, you know, the world of vitamins and artificial intelligence to help, uh, to help patients and, and move the field along very rapidly. It does this through things such like the Think Tank, which is an annual event uh, chaired and founded by uh, Glaucoma Foundation's founder, Dr. Rich. Um, and it provides a unique opportunity for scientists around the world to get together. And we were fortunate to just have a recent one uh, here in New York City. Um, it was the first time we all got a chance to got, get together after COVID. Everyone was very grateful uh, for that, but it was really another astounding event that the, and unique to the Glaucoma Foundation. There are a lot of sources for information. Uh, everyone knows Dr. Google, but um, the Glaucoma Foundation is, a, is an outstanding uh, source of, uh, of information that's very reliable and reviewed by, by, by experts in the field to make certain that it's factual, um, that it's timely, and that it's useful for patients. So I encourage you to take a look at those materials. Foundation also sponsors webinars uh, like these by, by some of the experts in the field, but also involving patients um, who share their experiences, which I think is, is very important. And I, th I come back to that, that it's important for patients to talk to their physicians about their experiences so that the physicians can get a better understanding of what is needed. And they, translate, they transmit that information to researchers. And that, that's how we as researchers um, identify our unmet needs. Um, of course, the foundation um, supports worldwide activities um, and patients of all ages, young ones, young patients and old patients, um, also glaucoma fellowships um, um, to help uh, advance the careers of our young glaucoma specialists, in this case, those that are, gonna, that are helping uh, underserved um, target populations that, that desperately need additional care. Um, Elena has been an active member and representative uh, of the Glaucoma Foundation. I want to thank her for all that effort with worldwide organizations. It's really very important. Um, there are lots of grants that the Glaucoma Foundation is involved with, um, and uh, we appreciate the support. Some of our people have donated to the foundation are on this Zoom, and I appreciate that, that support as well. You know, just in closing, you know, 2020 and 2021, you know, that was shaped by COVID-19. But looking forward, you know, to 2022 and beyond, it's going to be shaped by all of us. You know, we live in a, uh, a world of fantastic science, tremendous opportunity. And um, I'm very reassured that, you know, advancing knowledge is transforming care for patients now. You know, as a, as a doctor who takes care of patients um, every day, you know, I'm always thinking about the person in front of me, that, that N of one, we call it, um, and how um, I can best serve and how my colleagues can best help that patient. Um, and that, that's our goal. It's the goal of the Glaucoma Foundation. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. And it's really been a privilege to speak to you today. Thank you so much, Jeff. What a wonderful presentation and so educational. I'm sure patients really loved it. So I will start with the questions that we received uh, prior to this event, and then I'll go to the chat and questions and answers to see how many we can answer. I promised everybody that we'll stop sharply at six. So we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So let me start with first question. Lumigan versus Raclatan. From your experience, how, when would you prescribe these medications? Well, I mean, it's very difficult to talk about individual medications. You know, the, uh, 
1997, the first prostaglandin, latanoprost, was approved. It was a once a day medication. Uh, we were fortunate to be involved with in that research effort. And it really transformed uh, glaucoma care. It is now the number one medication. Prostaglandin class is the number one medication uh, in the world. And Lumigan is a member of that class. Rocklatan, of course, has latanoprost in it. Mm -hmm. and, and in addition, it has another medication. So these are both outstanding medications. They're both once a day. Um, I think most physicians probably start with a single drug, like a latanoprost or a lumigan or something else, and then would advance a patient to something like rocklatan, which has two medicines in the same bottle and can be a highly effective medication. So there are many patients who might benefit from that kind of approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Neuroplasticity declines with age. I've read that vision loss that occurs later in life can lead to cognitive decline. Can you talk about eye health and the brain? So I think uh, the issue of neuroplasticity is a fascinating one. For those people who don't, are not familiar with neuroplasticity, it involves you know, the reorganizing and growth of cells inside the brain as, we, um, as it develops and throughout life. Um, it used to be thought that the, once the brain was developed, there was no further reorganization or growth. Um, that connections didn't, weren't made easily. Um, I think that we now know that there's much more going on in the living brain on a long-term basis um, than, than we thought, previously thought. Everyone knows that a child um, developing very rapidly is different than an older adult. We all wish we were you know, that young again. Um, but um, there is evidence that, that even after having some conditions that, you know, transient ischemic attacks where the brain is temporarily starved of oxygen or mild stroke, you can rebuild back um, neuronal connections. So we're certainly creating memories all the time and those are also neuronal connections. So there's a lot happening in the brain. Granted, of course, we slow down a bit as we get older. Um, and the processing time of the older adult is slower than perhaps a teenager, um, but the ability to absorb conceptual information remains similar uh, over a lifetime. So there's a lot of good things that are occurring in, the, in that field. And actually, as, as uh, I'm sure many of the people on this call follow the scientific advances in this field. There are now some drugs, some controversial medications that um, have been approved, that's approved for Alzheimer's disease that uh, may help some individuals. Actually, we tried maybe 15 years ago to use an Alzheimer's drug, memantine, to uh, repurpose it for glaucoma. It was a huge trial. It was sponsored by Allegan at the time. It was a worldwide effort with over 2,000 patients. It took five years. It turned out that, that we could not demonstrate a good enough benefit to get that approval, but it did show the interest in the whole field and demonstrated that there's enough worldwide expertise to get these things approved. So just for the, with respect to the relationship between the eye and the brain, you know, the eye is a piece of the brain. When you're looking into the eye, we look at the retina, and the optic nerve, every single one of those cells is a nerve cell. So over the years, we've tried to look at the eye you know, as a window on the brain and try to measure nerve cells and how they're functioning um, and try to understand brain function from that. And actually a lot of researchers use the eye and the optic nerve as a way to, to, gen, to study nerve cells because it's so easily available and reachable in animal models of disease. Um, when something happens in the brain, we can sometimes see it in the eye. When someone has a stroke, we can see the nerve cells that actually can die inside, inside, the, inside the eye, or if someone has a tumor, for example. Um, there is no direct correlation between, let's say, glaucoma and cognitive impairment, but um, they're all neurodegenerative disorders, and a lot of the pathways by which these cell dies, cells die are similar, and some of the treatments that will be useful for Parkinson's disease will hopefully prove useful for glaucoma. And hopefully disease for glaucoma might prove useful for those. That's what we're hoping as well. 
Thank you very much. Uh, next question. What are some effective eye drops for glaucoma that do not contain a preservative? And the, 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 the person who asked the question said specific names would be very useful to discuss with my ophthalmologist. Well, there are, <laughs> I think that preservative-free medications, first of all, I think are beneficial to many patients. Because a lot of us, we take an eye drop. Remember that medications, eye drops are chemicals. There's two types of chemicals in, in the bottles. You know, there's the medicine and then there's the preservatives. Mm -hmm. So we're taking a chemical, we're putting it on our eye, it lowers the pressure, of course, um, which is good, but we're still putting chemicals on our eye. And some people react with inflammation and irritation um, from using the drops, particularly if you're using more than one. Mm -hmm. you know, most people can take one drop, but when we start asking patients to take two, three or four drops, the cumulative effect of the toxicity of the drop can make the eye red, and dry, and irritated. And um, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to use fewer drops. So there are some medications that come preservative free. Um, the drug Timolol, Timoptic, is the most common one. Um, it's also generic now as a preservative free. It comes in a unit dose dispenser. The prostaglandin I spoke to, Latanoprost, does not come that way, but a sister molecule called Tafluprost or Zyoptan, um, is, uh, comes as a single dose dispenser, and COSOPT, um, which is a combination of timolol and dorzolamide, can also be obtained preservative free. So those are three medications that are preservative free that are available. And there may be some others that are around the world that, that you could theoretically uh, obtain if you have a, you know, a friend who lives in another country, for example. Uh, but those three are available in the US and we use them quite often. Thank you very much. I, uh, by the way, I want to tell everybody that this webinar will be recorded and will be placed on our website. And if you didn't catch what Dr. Lipman was saying, you'll be able to view it again, or you can email me and uh, I'll be able to respond to you as to specific uh, um, medicines without the preservatives. Uh, you touched upon this question a little in your presentation, Jeff, but there was a specific question that the type of research that TGF is currently funding and why is it important? So the Glaucoma Foundation funds a uh, wide variety of, of research <clears throat> uh, spanning a lot of different areas. Um, it had, uh, in the beginning of the foundation, we sponsored area research in the area of gene identification and genetics, um, neuroprotection, and more recently exfoliation syndrome. So as we learn more about different types of glaucomas, we realize they have different, they're different diseases, they have different gene defects. And so we try to understand what each, each disease is, um, what the defect is and how it can be treated. So the Glaucoma Foundation sponsored a series of think tanks, brought together people from all over the world and looked at exfoliation syndrome. But there's much more to glaucoma than just that. Of course, there are many factors that contribute to glaucoma and to the health of nerve cells in general. I'd say that that is the major focus of the Glaucoma Foundation research is how do you preserve nerve cells? What are the environments they need to be in? What things can, how can we stimulate them to, to grow and be healthy? Um, and those types of issues are, are, are critical to the future. When I say the future, I'm talking about drug development five, 10, 20 years down the road. Foundation also just is looking at, at areas of, of research now that are um, will be applicable in the next three years. For example, looking at ways to better understand the testing information that we have using artificial intelligence. Of course, we hear about artificial intelligence in all sorts of fields. There happens to be an artificial intelligence approved, artificial intelligence platform approved for detection of diabetic retinopathy. So ophthalmology is kind of leading the way in, in that regard. And um, you know, our goal is to try to find out who's gonna progress. We can predict who's gonna progress and who's gonna progress quickly. That's gonna be critically important. And also, you know, maybe there are ways to detect the disease that are beyond the human's ability to detect it. I mean, that doesn't take away anything from the doctoring part. You know, so there are some doctors or patients who are worried about things like artificial intelligence. Just because we get a piece of information from a computer system doesn't, it doesn't mean that the computer system is gonna tell us what to do. 
we have to have a discussion about what that means and um, what, what it means about the risk and what the risk is to the patient, the patient's desires. So it strengthens the doctor's ability to have an important discussion with the patient. I think that that's critical. Sometimes a doctor can get overwhelmed with data. You come to my office, you'll see me looking at three screens of data and we have to synthesize that. And I think having a computer algorithm to help us will be, will be useful. Um, we're also looking, as I mentioned, at, at vitamin therapy and the Glaucoma Foundation is very supportive of that. Um, you know, just because we talk about a vitamin doesn't mean that the final drug product will be a vitamin, right? We can use the vitamin to, to build a new drug off of that. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of interesting work that the foundation's you know funding, and, and, and fortunately, there's no lack of ideas. And uh, the uh, the ability to to push this forward is limited only by you know the budget. The government spends billions on a lot of things. A you know, billion dollars would probably cure glaucoma. So uh, you know we need to push them as well. The foundation acts as an advocate for more public spending in this field. So that's, that's critically important to call your congressman and let them know that this is important. Thank you very much, Jeff. So uh, a lot of people are asking about the nicotinamide and would you recommend that all glaucoma patients take it? No, of course, everyone's <laughs> interested in, in that. And, um, it's much too early to determine you know, whether or not people should be using vitamins. We've studied everything over the years. You know, when I worked at New York Eye and Ear Infirmary with Bob Ridge, Celso Tello, and the whole team there, we looked at uh, ginkgo and all sorts of other different types of compounds, um, Chinese herbal teas. And, you know, we're all looking for something that can be useful. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a couple of things, though, that, that are useful now. The first is exercise. You know, glaucoma is a disease that is a, that, um, is uh, the nerve is affected by a lot of different factors. One of which, of course, is the pressure in the eye. Another is the blood flow to the eye. And maintaining good cardiovascular health is critical to maintaining good health of the optic nerve. So we see all the time people who, you know, as we get older, we develop the disorders, atrial fibrillation, a heart attack, different types of cardiovascular events. So it's critically important to do that. You should absolutely not smoke. It decreases the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is bad for the nerve cells in the eye. Um, so I think if you're doing those two things, you know, exercise, maintaining good cardiovascular health, not smoking, you know, limiting alcohol consumption and maintaining good health, that will maintain the, the nerve cells inside the eye will be beneficial for that. So we're going to have information about, you know, nicotinamide treatments. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, whether what other things can be used. Um, the article is going to be published soon. You can take a look at it. And uh, we'll be curious. We're going to get a lot of feedback from patients and colleagues. And uh, when we design the next trial, we'll have more information. Next year, we can come back here and discuss the results of that. And, and hopefully, there'll be room here for some kind of um, nutritional supplementation to support nerve cells. We're very, you know, we think it's promising. We need the data, you know. There's there are some people, some doctors perhaps, or other individuals who will, you know, want to to use compounds that really are not tested. Remember, all of these things are biologically active, right? So if we take too many vitamins, that's not good for us either, because they can upset the upset physiology mm -hmm. in other ways. Now, we're all primed to take vitamins. My mother told me to take a vitamin every day. I had to take those little Flintstone things, <laughs> for children. And, uh, you know, we, so we were all told to take a vitamin. So the, it's like the society has set us up for it. But we have to be very careful that as we get older, we don't want to upset the rest of our physiology and biology. So let's be careful about what we do. Thank you. And of course, since we're talking about vitamins, we have a a flurry of questions and one very specific uh, from a patient who does not want to go the surgery route and would like to know whether there are any current holistic solutions to exfoliation glaucoma other than the surgery, of course. You know, exfoliation uh, syndrome is one of the big challenges that, that we face because the pressure is often very high and it's very, it fluctuates a lot. Um, that's why the foundations chose to work on it. and. Uh, 
for a while. And that's why there's so much worldwide interest in it. Um, very often, it's a, in some ways, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a good disease to have because we know a lot about it. It does respond very well to laser surgery typically, which is obviously non-invasive. For some individuals, cataract surgery, um, at the time of cataract surgery seems to mitigate the process. Um, but if you were in Europe where this is Northern Europe, Scandinavia, this is very common. Surgery is often done very early in the course of the disease process. Sometimes it's hard to control um, with that with medications. But I wish there was a holistic way of dealing with it. You know, the foundation has sought to find a way to dissolve the exfoliation material or stop the process of its formation. That's where the research endeavor is for the foundation. And I think that we, by understanding the genetics, um, understand the, the, the mechanism a little better. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to develop the treatment. And that's the stepwise process we have to take. Mm -hmm. But um, simply, uh, you know, there's no, there's no medicinal or nutritional way of decreasing its formation. Thank you very much. I think that's all the time we had for the question. I would like to thank you, Jeff, so much for this wonderful presentation. We are very grateful to you for sharing your expertise and your passion today. And of course, I thank all our audience for attending today. Uh, we do sincerely hope that you found something valuable, something inspiring, something thought-provoking in today's talk. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you would like to review the webinar again and hear the name of three drugs without any preservatives, it will be on our website within probably uh, a week under events, and we will post the recorded session. As always, the foundation would love to hear your feedback. If you have any comments, any additional questions or topics that you would like us to address in future webinars, please email it to me, esterman at glaucomafoundation.org. I look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to staying with, in touch with all of you. And of course, please continue supporting the Glaucoma Foundation. Your support is incredibly important in moving the science forward. Thank you all very much and have a great evening. Good night.